So hello everyone, I'm very pleased to be here. So before we start, uh, the slides of these presentations are online, so you don't need to take uh, any pictures, except maybe from this first slide where the URL is. Uh, I'm Pierre Pavlides. Uh, you can find me online under the username of Rockdam. And uh, a few years ago, at, uh, I worked at the University of Birmingham, uh, and my work leads to a paper I co-authored with uh, Flavio Garcia, David Oswald, and Timo Kasper. Uh, this paper was published at uh, USENIX Security 2016, so this was last August. And uh, thanks to this paper, we have quite a good uh, press coverage here, like from the BBC or from Riot. So the, like most of the press focused on the first part of the paper, which is uh, car hacking on Volkswagen, Volkswagen's cars. And there's uh, another part of this paper that I will cover more in this talk. So, in this talk, we will first uh, see what RKI stands for, but also how to design uh, an RKI system from scratch. And now, uh, the second and third part will be flows that can be found in RKI systems, so in real-life RKI systems. First flows will be in the uh, first system, which is the Volkswagen system, and the second one, uh, which is called uh, the HITECH 2 system. So first, how to, uh, what is RKI in the first place? So RKI uh, stands for Remote Keyless Entry System, but I'm going to go to that just after. Let's see uh, about security mechanisms of cars. So the first thing is how to get inside a car. So either to stall what is inside or later on to drive the car. But first, how to go inside. So historically, there's like mechanical locks to open the doors, and they are still present today. Then, the RKI system, the one we'll focus in this talk, is when you press a button on the remote, and the car opens. So it's also work for uh, closing the car, sometimes uh, raising an alarm, or uh, launching the heating system, so it depends on the car models. Another way, which is like the most recent cars have, is smart keys. Smart keys are uh, remotes that you have in your pocket and you don't have to press any button, you just come close enough to the car and the car opens itself. So we won't cover this part in uh, this talk, we'll focus on RKI systems, which I believe is the most widely used right now. Once you are inside the car, you want to start the engine and drive away. So the uh, first requirement is to be inside the car first. This is important. If you're not in the inside the car, you cannot drive the car, most of the cases. We have a security mechanism, which is called an immobilizer. Uh, this security mechanism uh, simply tries to find a transponder, which is a small, uh, small RFID chip, which is inside the remote keys. And if uh, it's it is close enough to the ignition, then the car is allowed to, to start, otherwise it won't start. And uh, once we have the two first conditions in line, uh, there is usually a mechanical lock or an ignition button, so another step uh, depends on the car. So basically, once you are uh, inside the car, I would argue that the game is over because there have, have already been a lot of attacks on transponders, so the part with immobilizers. And also, once you are inside the car, you can do attacks on the onboard computer, so via the uh, CIN bus or stuff like that, and uh, maybe uh, directly start the engine or reprogram a new remote to be associated with this car. So once you are inside the car, uh, the game is over. So in this talk, we will cover attacks on RKI systems and not new car features, such as some cars nowadays are like connected to the internet and you can start the engine from your smartphone via the internet. So this likes good feature from a security point of view, but we'll not cover that in this talk. Okay, so if you look at a uh, remote, I have two of them here. In the first one, in the first system, you can s clearly see the, the big part with the buttons, which is the RKI part. 
And uh, the smallest part here is the part responsible for the, the transponder and to uh, disable the, the, the immobilizer. So there are some uh, car keys which have the two parts separated. Others, like this one, have the two parts in one PCB uh, with uh, the transponder part, which is here, which is soldered and actually interacts with uh, the inboard IC. Um, so, depending on the remote, it's either separated or close together. Okay, so what is the protocol of an Akai system looking like? It's really simple. First, the owner of the car presses a button on uh, the, the key. Then, the remote sends a message to the car and the car reacts accordingly. So it's really a simple protocol. There is a single messages, a single message going from the remote to the car. And this means that all the security protocols we usually see don't apply here. Like, for, exa for example, if you use Samba authentications or mechanisms like that, there is no uh, challenge response mechanisms that could apply here because we have just only a single message from the remote to the car. It's not like if the car could send a first a challenge and then the remote will uh, reply to that challenge. So. It seems simple, there is only one single message, so we can maybe create an RK protocol from scratch. So, to do so, what do we want? We want the user to press a button and the car to know what button it pressed. So, the first idea is just to send the button, give an identifier, maybe one is open, two is closed, and so on, and send uh, the button. But here we have a problem, because if I push a button, my car will open, but also all the other cars around. So this is quite uh, an issue, because I just want to open my car and don't want to open all the cars in the parking lot. So to do so, we need a way to identify which car we want to open, right? So to do so, we just add a, uh, an identifier, UID, which can either be, which can either identify the car or the remote. I will argue that uh, identifying the remote is better simply because later on we can invalidate a specific remote if we want. Like if uh, the user loses some remote, we can then uh, tell the car to ignore uh, that remote for later on. So it's like a security feature for, for free, basically. Okay, so now we know which button is pressed and which remote is sending the message. Th then there's still an attack, right? If the attacker is close enough, for example, let's see the following scenario. We have a user which comes back from work, so she, uh, that user closes the car and walks away. But then the attacker was close enough, and by close enough I mean less than 100 meters, so not that far, it can be quite far, I mean. And it, uh, the attacker is drop a closed signal. So the attacker has access to the UID and the button. From there, the attacker can just change the button from a closed to an open and send that whole message and uh, the car will open. So we need uh, a way to uh, provide integrity to the message sent. So for integrity, usually there's two ways. We can uh, either use a symmetric or an asymmetric key. So the, the crypto block in the first case is called a signature. So we will have a private key. So for example, the remote will sign the message which with its private key. And then on the car side, the car will have the public key of the remote and checks that the signature is valid. The issue here is that asymmetric uh, cryptography is usually costly battery-wise, and since the remote has a small battery, uh, we don't want it to uh, go away really fast. We can use a MAC, so that stands for Message Authentication Code, and this time the, the same key is shared between uh, both ends, so there, there will be the same key in the remote and in the car. And usually when we use message authentication code or symmetric cryptography in general, the issue coming with it is key management. Because it's, it is hard to give to the other party the, the key, 
to uh, use uh, symmetric cryptography without uh, disclosing it in the first case. But here it's not really a problem in uh, our use case because when we uh, want to link a remote with a car, at this time we can generate a random shared key and push it uh, at the same time in the remote and in the car. So this is good. Now we have a Mac which is computed using a key which is uh, linked to a specific uh, UID, so to a specific remote. And that mark uh, provides the integrity of uh, the message M here. And the message can be either the button, so that the button cannot be changed, or the UID plus the button. It doesn't really matter because on the car side, the car will look for the first part, the UID. The car will check that the UID is indeed uh, a valid UID, a UID for a remote the car knows. And then from that UID, uh, it will do a lookup in the database maybe to retrieve the shared key. And with the shared key, it will be able to check that uh, the Mac is valid over that message. Okay, great, but it doesn't, uh, there's still a attack scenario uh, which is not covered here, is replay attacks. So in this scenario, uh, for example, the users in the morning takes uh, its car to go to work. So it goes to its car, opens the car and drives away. At that time, an attacker may be close enough to eavesdrop the message. Okay, fine. And then later on in the evening, the users come back from work lock the car and uh, walk away, right? And uh, the attacker can just replay the same message uh, captured in the morning and the message will be valid because the UID uh, will be the UID of the real remote, so no issue here. The button will be open, like in the morning, and the Mac will be valid because it was valid in the morning, there is no reason it is uh, not valid in the evening, right? So replay attacks uh, are an issue here, and to uh, do something against it, usually what we don't want is freshness. And for freshness, there is, uh, we usually use a token, and there are three main ways to do so. Token can be random. So for example, when uh, we want to, uh, pr uh, to avoid CSRF attacks, the server will generate a random token, send it to the client, and then the client will uh, send that token back to the server later on, and the server checks that the token is the same. So this is uh, what some frameworks like the SAP from the OWASP is doing. And in our case, however, this is quite a problem because for RKI systems, there is only one message, it's one way. So there is no way the car will be able to give that random, that, uh, random token to the remote. It's only one way. So if the remote generates the random token itself, then uh, the issue is that the car needs to remember all tokens forever. Like uh, if uh, the car needs to remember the token used last month, but also two months ago, and so on and so forth. So then it can be an issue. Tokens can be time-based. So if we take a Google Authenticator as a second way of authentication, they use uh, RFC 6238, which use a uh, token based on time. And the issue uh, with time-based tokens is that we need, first of all, a clock to be able to have some time. So usually in the car, having a clock is not an issue at all. But in the remote, this is an issue because a, co a clock is costly battery-wise. And then the clock we need to be in sync and precise. So for Google Authenticator, there is a 30 second window for each token to be valid. But here with remotes, you know, uh, it's quite hard to have a precise clock when you don't communicate with anybody. Uh, and this is, will be a, in any way a costly battery rise. So the last idea is to use a counter. And a counter has two main problems. The first one is overflow, because you use a fixed number of bits to represent the counter, and when you have that maximum value and you add one, then it goes back to zero, right? The second problem is desynchronization. 
Say your user is quite nervous and use the remote key of uh, its car to uh, like uh, press the button again and again, again and feel better, right? But then the counters increase at the time, and when the user go back to uh, his car, then the counter of the car and the counter of the remote don't match. So this is decentralization, and to go around it, we use a counter with a validity window, which is means that the counter can be a little bit off by some value and still be valid. And then again, overflow, we just see values in the circle, so no issue here. Okay, to sum things up, we have a UID, the button, now a counter, and we do the mark over the button and the counter. Okay, so this is called a whirling code because basically it changes every single time and there is no code which are gen generated which are the same. Okay, so here is what we have as uh, the RKI system we built from scratch. So let's check the basic properties of security, right? Confidentiality. I will really argue that confidentiality is not really important here. What we want to provide really is we want to avoid that an attacker is about to steal your car, right? We don't really care if the ID of the remote is disclosed from someone nearby. Integrity, this is what the, the Mac is for, so we've cover we have covered this already. And availability is quite a hard topic. So what most uh, remotes are doing is that they are sending the message several times in a row with some pauses in uh, between, so usually three or five times, and hoping for the best. Maybe there's some noise, maybe there's an attacker who, who is generating some noise, but in any way, in the worst case scenario, the owners go back to mechanical, mechanical locks and everything is fine, just like when uh, the remote goes out of battery, right? Okay, so this is what an RKE system protocol might look like. And now we will look at real ones. One first from uh, the Volkswagen system. So uh, when we call it Volkswagen systems, it's actually the Volkswagen group. So it includes Audi, Seat and Skoda. And the names of the cars here and car models are the one we tried it against. So quite a few. Okay, so to do the analysis on uh, this one, we dumped uh, the firmware uh, responsible for handling RKI on the car side, and then do uh, reverse engineering on the assembly. We found four different schemes, which we named conveniently Volkswagen 1 to 4, and the first one is used until 2005. It goes like this. First, there is some function f applied to the UID of the remote, then another function g applied to the counter, and then a button, with f and g which are deterministic. So, what the issue is here? The issue is that there is no secret key, no integrity checks whatsoever, so this is purely security through obscurity. If someone is about to do the same thing as us and reverse the f and g functions, then basically we can clone a remote and uh, we just need to get the UID of a valid remote, so maybe listening to a rolling code will be enough, and then we can uh, generate um, values for like opening or closing the car in the future. Okay, so surely they improved this with the second scheme, Volkswagen 2, which was used since 2004. So, first let's start with a fixed prefix. Okay, so there's nothing about security here. And then there is a cipher, an encryption cipher, which is called O64, which is applied to the UID, a counter, a button, and then for some reason there is a button again. Okay, so the first issue here is that we're using an encryption function to provide integrity, whereas encryption provides confidentiality and not integrity at all. So that's quite an issue, but there is a bigger issue here. The issue is that key 2 doesn't depend on the remote or on the car whatsoever. It's static, one key for the whole world. 
So basically, if someone uh, reverse engineers the firmware, the firmware or gets the key in any way, then it's game over, right? We get a rolling code, we can decrypt it, modify whatever we want to, recrypt it, and okay, fine. So surely they improve with uh, the next schemes, right? Volkswagen 3, Volkswagen 4. So Volkswagen 3 is used uh, since 2006, and the first one is used since 2009. And here we will play a game of differences, right? Catch the difference here. There is Volkswagen 2 again. Volkswagen 3. OK, so the start at the beginning is uh, different. OK, right. And uh, then let's change the global key. OK, but it's still one key for every single car. So same thing, basically. OK, Volkswagen 4. Mm, start is different. The key is another one, still. And let's change the cipher, OK. So the cipher is a little bit better because there has been some theoretical vulnerabilities on old 64. But still, the same issue is that the same key is used for every single remote, right? OK, so this is all uh, the Volkswagen systems we've looked at. So it is basically possible to clone a remote if we capture a single rolling code. Because from a single rolling code, no matter what the system we use, we, be, we will be able to go back to the UID counter and button by de decrypting it, then changing maybe the counter by incrementing it by one, the button to make sure that it is an open button, and uh, doing the encryption again to have another valid uh, rolling code. So I have a, a video for that. So this is a, a Volkswagen car here. I don't see if you see the blinking lights. So first the car now opens and then closes the, the, the car. But while he was doing this, there was like a beautiful device here, which was eavesdropping and be able to generate the next running code. So close, open. Or the other way around, open, close, open, close. So this means that the counter has been increased by four in the meanwhile. And then when we go back to the real uh, remote, because the counter uh, of the car has been uh, increased by four, the first four times we press the button, it does nothing because the car checks that counter. And the five time it works. Thank you. So the impact here is most Volkswagen group vehicles uh, are impacted after 2000, 2000, except the most recent one, uh, so Golf 7 and uh, so on, which are a little bit more secure. So we haven't looked at them, so we have to trust uh, the manufacturer here. Well, they did improve between schemes a little bit with the cipher, so maybe it's better on the last one. OK, so this was the Volkswagen system part. And definitely, uh, that has a lot of problems in key management. For the HiTech 2 system, it was quite different. Uh, the HiTech 2 system first is used by many car manufacturers. Uh, it is a product that this company are buying. On the right here, we, uh, I have taken a screenshot for from the paper, and this is uh, the model of cars we tried it on. OK, so this time, instead of reverse engineering the firmware, we did it in black box of uh, what is sent over the air, right? So what the signal is looking like. And uh, as far as hardware is concerned, we used software-defined radio. So you can use either uh, HackRF or uh, something like a cheap TV uh, receiver. Or once you know what the modulation and stuff looks like, we can use an Arduino with simply a uh, $3 uh, RF chip. OK, so once we move from the airwaves and modulation to uh, bit streams, it looks like this. So this is all uh, uh, running codes taken on the same remote. So each line is a different rolling code. And if you look at it, you can find that the first part seems to be really similar, and the last part changes, right? 
So to see the differences uh, better, what we can do is like frequency analysis, and here is a graph of the changes from one trust to the one just after. So we can see that here in the beginning for the first few uh, bits, actually for the 51st bits, here there is no changes at all, they are always constant. And after, well, it's not that clear, but there are definitely some changes, right? Oh, by the way, this is computed over, over 2 to the 12th rolling code, so I had to push like 4,000 times the button of the rolling code to get all this information. It was really fun. Okay, if you look at here in more details, the, the first part here, so I here it is again, when what you can see is this is an exponential increase, right? If you plot uh, the logarith logarithm of uh, the first graph, you see that it is linear, so it is in indeed an exponential increase. With the right mode bi rightmost bit is changing every single time, then the bit just on the left is changing half of the times, then fourth of the times, and so on and so forth. So this is a counter. With some work, uh, we were able to find how this works. So there is a fixed start at the beginning, then there is a, the UID of the remote. So in the previous slide here, it was never changing because all the traces came from the same remote. But by using another remote, it became uh, clear. Then there is a button, then a counter, then some kind of key stream, and at the end, a uh, checksum, which is just XORing all other bytes. Okay, so the security c really comes from the key stream, right? And we need some external information because just by looking at the traces, we will ne never be able to figure out what the key stream is uh, coming from. So if we look back here at the PCB of the remote, we look at the chip. So NXP is a manufacturer, and we have a part number. So if we look at the part number, so this is for remote killer's entry, so we are going in the good way, and this is uh, HITAG2. So HITAG2 is a stream cipher which is uh, used in transponders. Transponders, uh, you know, this is, uh, has been, there has been a lot of attacks, so the HITAG2 uh, stream cipher has been reverse engineered, we actually have the C code for it, from it, and there have been several attacks to recover the key from the output of the HITAG2 cipher. So by the way, this is the frequency analysis of the outputs of the real remote, and what we'll be expecting from a real uh, cipher, a strong cipher, is like 50% of the times like the bits are 50% of the time 0 and 50% of the time 1, right? So a linear, just a line at 50%. Here it's clearly not the case with especially bit 6, which is 0. So it seems like this is not a good cipher. So uh, the key stream is some function of that I tag 2, and we don't know what to use for the key, the serial, and the IV. For the serial, you can use an educated guest, like the UID of the remote is 32 bits, the serial you are expecting is 32 bits, and in the transponder part, they use the UID for the serial part, so okay. But what for the key? Actually, if you remember, this is uh, used for mixed system, meaning that the transponder and the RKE system are built into the same chip. So in that case, we have a reader from the transponder side which are about to read some part of the mem memory. So in blue here is uh, the key for the transponder, and in red there is two user pages, which means that we don't know what they are used for, but this is the same value as the key for th from the transponder. And moreover, this value here is like the default value in a test case for high tag 2. So it kind of looks like a key for, from HITAG2, and this is uh, the basic case because it is a blank remote I've uh, read the memory from, so it has never been associated with the car, so maybe this is the right key. So now we need to make know what the IV is looking like. 
So what we can do first is, gen is generating random IVs and computing the output of the high tag to cipher from them. And it looks like this. In blue, there's the one from the real remote, and in black, uh, the one we've generated. And basically, you see that on the six bits, it's zero, so it seems good. So we are confident that we are right here, and moreover, we are confident that there is no function applied to the output of the high tag 2 cipher. So this is quite good. What we need now is the IV. So to get the IV right, we need to make some assumptions. So first, the IV depends on the key, the UID, the button, and the cipher. I've called the IV uh, a phi function of the fourth input. But you know, the key and the UID are already used in other parts of the high tag 2 cipher. So maybe we can leave them out and see how it goes from there. And I will make another assumption, which is that the function phi is linear. Makes sense because it's in a remote with uh, constraints on uh, like PCB size and so on. So this means that there is some uh, coefficient alpha, beta, and gamma, uh, so that uh, the, this is linear. So what we can do now is take the counter and set the counter to zero. This is possible because the counter is 10 bits long, and we have recorded uh, 12 bits. Uh, 2 to the 12 running codes. So there is four traces for which the counter is zero. So then this means that we only need to find alpha and gamma here, and we can refer them. And we have hits for the button value, which is two, which is like an open button. Alpha equals one, and gamma is one of one of the fourth value here. Uh, we have a hit, so this is a success. And why are there four values here? It's because we have four uh, different uh, running codes here. OK, so now let's introduce the counter back and try to brute force beta, the value for the counter. It's not difficult. We quickly found that uh, beta is 16. And yeah, basically, we have the phi function at this point. The only question remaining is why are there four values of gammas? And it turns out, uh, with the coefficient we have, is simply that counter is more than 10 bits. Only 10 bits are sent over the air, but the counter to compute uh, the high tech 2 functions uh, is more than 10 bits. So simply, the phi function here is quite simple. It is a button plus 16 times the counter. Or since the button here is 4 bits long, we can just uh, concatenate the counter and the button. So if I get everything together, we know everything, right? We have a start, a new ID, a button, then a counter, which is sent over the air, but only the 10 right mode bits, then the key stream, and a checksum. OK, in our case, the key is uh, the one we read thanks to the transmitter. But uh, for the high tech tool schemes, they did it right for the key management part. So the key is specific to each single remote. So to clone the remote, we need the UID, counter, and key. We need, we need one ruling code to get the UID and counter. And to get the key, we need at least two traces, because each trace gives 32 bits of key stream, and the key is 48 bits of key streams. OK, so in the paper, there is details about an attack which requires 4 to 8 running codes, so 4 to 8 key presses, and works uh, in about 10 minutes on, on a laptop. And if I manage to show it, first we press uh, the buttons on the remote several times. So I don't know if you see on the screen here, there's like a dump of what is sent over the air, right from the Arduino here. Then we uh, we run the attack, so the attack is taking 10 minutes, so it's cut here. At the end of the attack, we get uh, back the key, the secret key, which is in the remote. And with this key, we are able to basically program the Arduino just to emulate uh, a remote and with an open and closed button.
Okay. Um, but now we, ni we need eight uh, running calls, right? So either we wait enough time to record at eight rolling codes, or we can maybe get the rolling code quicker. So if we look back at how a rolling code is looking like, if we if drop, and when we get back to the point of the just after the key stream, we can send noise to override the checksum so that the car, when uh, the car checks the checksum, the checksum is invalid, and does that consider the rolling code? So either the owner presses the button again, and we have two rolling codes for the price of one, or the owner doesn't press the, the button again, and this means that the car is not locked. And if the car is not locked, then we can go inside the, the car, right? So we win in both cases. OK, so to conclude with, we've seen what an RKE system is, how to build one from scratch, what the Volkswagen Group systems look like and the Hitech 2 systems look like. What I wanted to mention is that we did the responsible disclosure part at the beginning of the year. That poor crypto is bad, like Hitech 2 cipher is known to be broken. But then poor key management is worse, because even if you use the state-of-the-art best crypto cipher ever, if you use one single key for every car, well, not that great. And then again, the high tech to uh, cipher is still used in new ve vehicles. But we did see some improvement over time in the ciphers. And lastly, the last point is that this may explain several cases of theft where there is no signs of forced entry, meaning that maybe this was used in the wild before we did the research. Okay, that was all. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Do you have any idea as to why Volkswagen improved their schema over the years? Did they were they not happy with the situation? Or <laughs> no, I know I don't have any idea at all. No. Sorry. What were Volkswagen's reaction when you came to them with this? <laughs> um, actually, uh, Pablo Garcia wrote uh, like three or four years ago a paper on um, the immobilizer part, and then uh, he goes to court with Volkswagen over that paper during the responsible disclosure. So that like freezes all publication of this paper for a few years. And finally, uh, once the court was over, uh, the, the main problem was that it was difficult to get the right people to spoke to, to do the, dis uh, the responsible disclosure to. But after the court, finally we got to the uh, right people, so this time it went really better. Have you guys found any car locking system that hasn't been cracked yet? Um, the last one from Volkswagen for the Golf 7, we haven't looked at it at all, so maybe it's <laughs> a possibility. Is there any more questions? Ah, okay, one more. So when your uh, laptop was running the uh, brute force, was it not it was not talking to the car? No. No, no, no. no, no so it could potentially run a lot faster? Uh, a faster yeah, yeah. If I mean, if you try to run it on the cloud or stuff like that, yeah, it can run faster. The idea here is like saying that it's running for 10 minutes on uh, laptops means that you don't need to buy a huge cluster of machine on Amazon or anything like that to run the attack. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think that's it.
would say something, Jonas. There is now a little short, uh, not break, but uh, getting the next speaker and uh, setting him up. And uh, next uh, speaker will be on in uh, 15 minutes or so.